Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Collins, and esteemed members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Your investment in the National Guard has built a ready, capable, and professional force vital to our nation's defense and our communities in times of crisis. Thank you for your support. I would also like to recognize the efforts of my wife, Kelly, and our senior enlisted advisor, Tony Whitehead, for their support and partnership in addressing soldier, airman, and family needs. As a community-based force with the authorities to perform almost any mission, ensuring healthy and resilient guardsmen and families is not only our highest priority, it is foundational to all we do. This is my third time before you on behalf of the soldiers, airmen, and families of the National Guard. In that time, the National Guard has repeatedly demonstrated its capability, capacity, and readiness, both at home and overseas on a historic scale. Over the past three years, we performed over 28 million man days in our communities responding to emergencies of every kind. And as I speak, Guardsmen are supporting typhoon relief operations in Guam. In the last three years alone, the National Guard has rescued or saved 18,826 individuals. In the midst of all those events, our formation still met every one of our overseas deployments. This included the nation's final days in Afghanistan, where National Guardsmen helped defend the Kabul airport evacuate refugees, and then assist with Operation Allies Refuge. One of our other missions is the Joint Multinational Training Group, Ukraine. In concert with California's 30-year state partnership with Ukraine, our Guardsmen helped establish a training center in Ukraine after Russia's first invasion in 2014. Focused on combat arms and lessons learned, our National Guard trainers were some of the last to leave Ukraine before Russia's unprovoked invasion. A few months after the war began, we reestablished our training group and have been training our partners every single day since then. Today, every combatant commander leverages our state partnership program, which was recently mentioned, now includes 100 nations around the globe. Always ready, always there is not just our motto, it's our promise to America a promise we have kept for over 386 years. And in the 2,800 communities we call home, they know whenever or wherever a disaster occurs, the National Guard will be there because we already are. As I begin my final year as chief, there are still many things we must accomplish to ensure the National Guard remains always ready, always there. Today I'll shorten that list to four priority areas. The first is our Air National Guard units who have been performing space missions for over 28 years. In 1947, when the Air Force was established, the Air Guard's 29 original squadrons were established concurrently, and today's Air Force is the envy of the world. In 2019, when the Space Force was formed, it did not address nearly 30% of its operational squadrons that reside in the National Guard. With 1,000 personnel and 14 units, we are almost all tooth and no tail. These highly skilled airmen are absolutely vital to the success of the space mission. And just like our Air Force, we want today's Space Force to be the envy of the world. The second is premium free health care for currently serving guardsmen and reservists. There are many things we can surge in times of emergency, but medical readiness is not one of them. Access to care is critical to medical readiness, and the number one concern I hear from our guardsmen and recruiters when I visit our states and territories. To help recruit and retain the most talented, skilled, and ready force, all National Guard service members, regardless of status, need medical coverage. This is a matter of readiness, a matter of duty to the guardsmen who serve and sacrifice for our nation. We are working closely with the Adjutant General and the Defense Health Agency to clarify the number of guardsmen this would impact and what current programs could be reduced or eliminated so we can accurately identify the cost and the readiness benefit it could provide. The third is recapitalization of our Air Guard fighter squadrons. We have 25 fighter squadrons in the Air Guard, and our nation needs every single one of them. By working with the Air Force and Congress, we believe there is a path to recapitalize all 25 squadrons to the F-35, F-15EX, 
and our newest F-16s through fleet leveling and new aircraft buys. This would help the Air Force divest its older platforms and retain the capability, capacity, and force structure it needs to help meet combatant command and warfighting requirements. Lastly, I ask for your support in meeting the intent of the National Guard Empowerment Act to be a full member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and appropriately represent our 430,000 guardsmen and their families. Our vice chief cannot do that effectively as a subordinate to his peers. In closing, I want to thank you again for the National Guard we have today. All we do would not be possible without your support that you provide to our soldiers, airmen, and their families. I look forward to your questions.